Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to True Crime, the podcast that helps you find new, emerging, and undiscovered true crime podcasts. I'm Greg, the host and curator of True Crime. Today's episode is from Love and Murder. Love and Murder is a weekly true crime podcast about relationships that turned to murder. If you like today's episode, make sure to check out the episode description for links to subscribe. All right, let's get this show started. Begin. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder, the weekly true crime podcast discussing relationships gone terribly wrong, where our motto is, you're either someone's last love or their first murder. I am your host, Kai, and I know y'all missed me. Since I've been hosting alone, I haven't been gone this long, and it feels weird. It's only been like three days, but it feels weird. <laughs> well, listen to the end. Have I got a story to tell you, as well as some shout outs and reading your comments from last week's cases. In this episode, we're talking about a case of law enforcement mess ups. No, this episode is not bashing cops on a whole. It's bashing these cops, these law enforcement departments. And it actually wasn't just the police. It was just the entire law enforcement department dealing with this particular case. You'll see what I'm talking about. I want to remind you that this episode is sponsored by my Lamb Patreon and also my new Etsy shop. Now, don't get on me. I don't know if you say Etsy, Etsy. I always say Etsy, so Etsy it is. <laughs> it may it may annoy some of y'all, but Etsy it is. Um, but anyways, uh, the new shop, it's at lammarket.etsy.com, and that's two L- M's, L-A-M-M-A-R-K-E-T dot Etsy dot com. Um, there's actually a crazy sale going on in there right now, but both links are in the show notes below, and I'll tell you more about both of them after the show. Be sure to subscribe to Love and Murder right now while you're listening so you don't miss a case. And if you didn't know, you can also subscribe to our Patreon so that you don't have to hear intros or commercials and you'll be a sponsor of Love and Murder. Patreon.com forward slash Love and Murder. In the meantime, though, grab your butts, grab your apple juice, grab your true crime watching blanket that will be in the lamb shop tomorrow. And let's get into some Love and Murder. On October 6, 1983, in Melbourne, Australia, Frederick Boyle, who was originally from Peterson Super Eli, look, I had to look this up, Vale of Glamorgan in Wales. That is like the longest city slash state. I don't know, what would you call it? A province or whatever? So I'm guessing the city is Peterson Super Eli. And then the province is Vale of Glamorgan. And then this is in Wales, in the UK. I had to look that up because I'd never heard of this whole thing. Never, I'd heard of Wales, but the whole place, I'd never heard of it. Anyways, he woke up to find that his 30-year-old wife, Edwina Boyle, had disappeared. He said that he'd fallen asleep with all his clothes on on the couch, and when he woke up, he couldn't find his wife. What he did find, though, was a Dear John letter saying that she was having an affair and had run away with her truck driver lover named Ray. So, you know, deuces and all that junk. It's been real. Our love ran dry. I mean, whatever you want me to say to move on with your life. Bottom line, bye. Obviously, it didn't say all that, but that's what it said in my head. The couple had met on a bus in Cardiff, which is the capital of Wales, and yes, I had to look that up, and had moved from Britain to Australia in 1972 when they were still newlyweds. There, they shared two daughters, Sharon and Carissa. Carissa was the oldest, and they all shared a home in the suburbs in Dandenong, Dan, Dandenong, D-A-N-D-E-N-O-N-G, North Melbourne, Australia. Now, after he woke up and found that his wife was missing, he was devastated. I mean, she didn't just leave him, but she left their two kids And she left them to go off with some other guy. Everyone catered to him and the kids. Of course, they sympathized with him because how dare her leave him with the kids and go off with another man? Two days later, however, Fred moved another woman, Virginia Gisara, into the house. Why'd you wait so long, Fred? I mean, two hours would have been good, right? That's called sarcasm. 
Now, on the flip side, Edwina's sister, Valerie Bordley, didn't believe this story for one second. And moving this woman in so soon just had all her alarm bells going off. Seven years went by and Virginia and Fred lived in the house and raised the kids. Throughout the years, Valerie hired a PI in search of her sister or any evidence at all that her sister was still alive. She'd also been in regular contact with the police trying to convince them that her sister had disappeared. According to the PI, they literally couldn't find any evidence that Edwina existed, period, after the day that she supposedly left. There was no paper trail, no credit card evidence. She hadn't accessed her bank. So was she just living off raised money or something? Like, or she hadn't even touched her health cards. Also, in the beginning, she used to write her family all the time, and as time moved on, the letters became fewer and far between. In 1994, 11 years after her sister vanished, Valerie filed a missing persons report. However, the police didn't take it seriously and told her that she needs to accept that her sister had left, just like Fred said. Stop being crazy. You're searching for nothing. She's living another life. Leave us alone. We have cases to solve. One day, now I'm not sure of the year, this, there were so many, so few facts given. You know how I like dates and I like to give y'all exactly what date, time, day and everything. Look, I look all this up. I'll be like, what day was October 3rd, 1975? I look everything up. This one had no dates. Well, very little da dates. So like we said, one day, we're not sure of the year, day, month, anything, Carissa started dating a fellow named Michael Hegarty. One day, he was over at their house, and he noticed this big blue barrel in their backyard. Now, the barrel was big, like 44 gallons big, or to my metric people, 166.5 liters. He started joking about what was in the barrel. One day, he made a joke to Carissa that maybe, you know, maybe your mom didn't run away, but instead she's been killed and stuffed in that barrel. I mean, dark humor. Maybe Carissa thought it was funny. Maybe not. I'm not sure. You know who didn't find it funny, though? Fred. After this, he started acting anxious whenever people were around the barrel, looked at the barrel, or even touched the barrel. Like, what are you doing over there? Get away from it. Move away. Don't touch it. Like he just started and he never acted like this before. Now, Carissa and Michael got really serious and got married. Michael then moved in. He kept staring at that barrel like what in the world is in there? And he asked the story behind it, but the girls had no idea. They said that their dad always had it, moved it around with them from house to house over the years. And they just figured it was his stuff and never questioned it. So he asked Fred. And Fred said, oh, yeah, it's just full of glue. Huh? What? Uh, so this was weird to Michael, as honestly as you heard, it was weird to me, too. Well, I think his curiosity ended up getting the best of him because in August of 2006, Michael decided to break open the barrel. Inside, he found a burlap sack, or as my mom calls it, a hessian bag, and women's clothing. So I thought there was glue in there. I don't know. Maybe he just dumped his ex-wife clothing in there because, you know, he was pissed at her for abandoning the family. I can understand that. But then again, why not just toss it? Okay, well, whatever. To each his own. He went about his business. In October, so two months later, Michael found something else. Well, Carissa's husband was doing you know, husband stuff, I guess. And he was cleaning up the backyard and he saw that the burlap sack had been moved to the trash. This is weird because you held on for, to this thing for like 20 years, but now you throw it away. So he opened up the trash can and got the surprise of his life. Not only was the burlap sack in there, but there was also human bones and a human skull. So the police was called. No report of who called the police, just I know they were called. And they came out and collected all of the evidence, which was a whole skeleton. 
So, as you might have guessed, Edwina didn't run off and leave her kids after all. She'd been dead in this barrel in the backyard of each of their houses for the past 20 years. So, what actually happened to Edwina? This is the question. Well, forensically, Edwina had been shot in the head. Edward was arrested at his job right before 5 p.m. on that Friday. No, exact date wasn't given. You already know. I mean, they arrested him because what other evidence did they need? They had the barrel. What was he going to say? Someone broke in, killed her, put her in the barrel. I lied because I wanted to keep her close and y'all would take her away from me. I mean, I guess he could have said that, but he didn't. When he was arrested, he was interrogated at St. Kilda Road Police Headquarters. He said that when he got home one day, he found her dead in the bed. He couldn't tell how, but he panicked because... And I know y'all can't see me, but I'm shrugging my shoulders. You come home and you find your loved one dead and you panic. I mean, you'll panic because what killed her? Are they still in the house? Stuff like that. But he couldn't answer why he panicked. He just panicked. And then he said he's the one who left the notes, which we are all very shocked. Shocked, I tell you. And then ran and bought this barrel and put her body inside and encased it in cement so it wouldn't smell. So this is in my head now. This is in my head. I'm looking at this scenario. After he said that, the cops sat there and stared at him. He stared back with a hopeful look. Please believe me. And then the camera pans back to the cops and they're just sitting there staring at him still. Then said, yeah, so anyway, you're going to jail. We're charging you with murder and there will be a trial. And then they walked out of the room. I mean, that's how it happened in my head. Minus his story, because he really said that. So his trial started soon after his arrest. Again, no dates were given. And you better believe that her sister Valerie traveled all the way from Wales to go to this court case. Edwina's family never believed that she ran away with the milkman story. Fred pled, what lambs? What do you think he pled? Not guilty. And repeated his story to the court. During court, it came out that Fred was all kinds of evil. People who knew him reported that one time when they had gone horseback riding with him, his horse had gotten stuck in the mud. Now, let's pause. Lambs, what would you do if your horse got stuck in the mud? I hope in that brief pause, y'all said that you would try and help it out. But if you were one of those ones who said that you would grab a nearby wire and slowly strangle it to death, then obviously you need help. And you're as crazy as Fred because that's exactly what he did. Another time, he opened the oven in his house and found a mouse inside of it. Instead of trying to take it out, which I wouldn't, that's, you know, man work. Y'all can laugh at me. I don't care. I don't do mice. I don't do roaches. Hell no. That's what I call my husband for. And I remind him, that's why I married you. But instead of trying to take the mouse out, he just closed the oven and turned it on for the mouse to bake to death. Now, if that's not a lunatic, then I don't know what is. Then the court heard about the barrel and how long it had been taken from house to house. They were also told that when people came to the house for parties, they would be playing around the barrel, eating on it, you know, stuff you do when you see a barrel out. So note to self, when I see a barrel, don't touch it. I am actually going to be putting the pictures of party goers who are partying around a barrel in the Patreon if you want to see them. www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. And only he knew, I just want to make this clear, only he knew what was in that barrel. And he let people do it and sat there watching them without an ounce of care. Then Carissa took to the stand. She told the court that she remembers her parents were arguing before she disappeared. She remembered that they were arguing actually about Virginia. Quote, I would lay awake at night hearing them fight. She would say, you've been with her again. I did not know what an affair was then. End quote. So basically she heard them arguing, but she didn't understand like about what. As the trial continued, 
I guess he figured no one would believe that story because of everything that was coming out. So he finally admitted what happened. I don't know. Maybe he thought he would get time off for telling the truth. They'd go lenient on him like, okay, you told the truth. So we'll only give you a slap on the wrist and one year's probation. Maybe that's what he thought. I don't know why he suddenly came forward, but he did. He said that he strangled Edwina and then shot her in the head. Quote, my wife died in a terrible way and I was not going to let her remains be thrown down the tip like garbage. So wait a second. You did her a favor by putting her body in a barrel? Is that what you're getting at? Is that really what you're trying to say in court in front of all these people? Oh my God, the narcissism. The prosecution literally called him a, quote, pathological liar. And in February of 2008, 23 years after Edwina's disappearance, the now 58-year-old Fred Boyle was charged with first-degree murder of his wife. He was sentenced to 21 years in prison, with 17 of those years as a non-parole period. The Supreme Court Justice Jack Forrest said that Fred had shown zero remorse in what he'd done and had, quote, constructed a web of deceit and lies to avoid being caught. It also suddenly, shockingly, amazingly came out that 10 years after Edwina went missing, police suspected something else had happened to her. But whenever they spoke to Ed, he kept up the story of her running away. I mean, 10 years? Why so soon? Valerie is also the one who forced the police to open an investigation, as I said before. She'd reported the case to the Shady Lane Police in Watford in 1984, and they gave her information to Interpol, who gave it to the Victorian authorities. So basically, all those hands it passed through, yet if it hadn't have been for Michael, Fred would still be free. Anyway, this came to the hands of Coroner Wendy Wilmoth. The police told her that Fred had spoken to them and said, quote, I got nothing to hide. So they felt like she'd left and was living under a new name. Well, Dr. Wilmoth said back to them, quote, the length of time which has elapsed since Mrs. Boyle's disappearance with no contact with her children or family in Britain makes it extremely unlikely that she's alive. Dr. Wilmoth asked to see the notes and police said, well, um, ma'am, it, it appears that he destroyed the note. Right, so no evidence and y'all just, I don't know, took his word for it? Dr. Wilmoth responded with, quote, There may be some doubt as to whether Mrs. Boyle actually wrote the note, with the possibility being that Mr. Boyle forged her handwriting. So basically the one person with sense. Funny how this is all suddenly coming out. Actually, because of this case in part, there was a whole overhaul to the missing persons unit in 2006 in Australia. Well, in that area of Australia. And that is the case of Frederick Boyle. What do y'all think about this case and the utter disregard to even looking for this woman? You know how to get your thoughts to me. But today, I'm ending this episode with a short story time and reading your comments from last week's episodes. Normally, I wouldn't do this because I personally, personally, I'm not judging anybody else. This is me because this is my platform and I do things differently on my platform, how I like it and how y'all like it when you message in with common sense requests. I personally think it's disrespectful to the case If, you know, I do like a story about myself or, you know, something like that after the case, or I feel like if it's like something funny or lighthearted, I don't know why. I just feel it's disrespectful. That's just me personally. However, today I'm going to do this because the episode was late and I feel you lambs deserve an explanation. And I was going to put out the comments episode on Saturday and I didn't get to that, nor did I get to put out the full episode on Sunday or even at commute time today, Eastern Standard Time. So story time first. You're listening to an episode of Love and Murder on True Crime by Indie Drop-In. We're going to take a quick break. And now back to this episode of Love and Murder. 
while I'm sitting here minding my business, you know, getting the show ready and everything like that, brushing up my research so I can give you all all the information, I'm eating and then suddenly I feel something like hard, like what? I, I wasn't even eating anything hard. I'm eating something that should be actually soft. I was like, what is this thing? And I spit out my tooth, my freaking tooth. So I run upstairs because I'm, my daughter probably would have grabbed her phone and turned on the camera, but I'm old. So I ran upstairs to look in the mirror and I'm seeing there's a gaping freaking hole in my mouth with a bit of tooth in it. So I'm looking and it looks rotten, like my tooth was rotten. I'm not sure. But backstory, this tooth was a root canal. And back backstory, the root canal was because the dentist I was going to, they had filled a small cavity and they apparently left like a pocket in my tooth. So food was just sitting there building up for years. So I come back from my six month um, checkup and they tell me I need to do a root canal, first root canal of my entire life. And I told them that they did this to my teeth. And they were like, oh, there's no records of it. I don't know what you're talking about. This has been the only dentist I've been going to for years. So I don't have records of it. It couldn't have possibly been us. Okay, whatever. Do the root canal. I think July, one of the dentists, I was doing my checkup again. One of the dentists had done the x-ray and she said, I see a pocket in there. So I was like, well, it hasn't even been five years, so y'all need to redo this for free because I'm not paying for this. So she was like, well, I'm not a dentist who did it. You got to talk to the dentist who did it, blah, blah, blah. Went back, talked to that dentist, and he said he didn't see anything. Oh, I don't see a pocket. But, and I quote, if you start feeling pain or when you start feeling pain, I can't remember if he said if or when, then call us back. So I'm thinking to myself, so I should wait till my teeth rots before you do something about it. So I've already booked another dentist. I did my research, found another dentist, booked another appointment. But, you know, post COVID, it's not as simple to go to another doctor or dentist or anything medical. There is a long waiting period if you are a new patient now. So I have an appointment coming up, but it's not even this month. That's how long it is. It's, it's some time. Okay, whatever. I'm going to have that doctor look, that other dentist look. So then my teeth breaks. And I told this woman, um, this is the same dentist who had seen the pocket. And I'm telling her that she said this. And I said, but he said this. And she's all like, oh, well, I don't see. I said, it doesn't look rotten to you. She's like, oh, I can't tell because your teeth broken freaking half. And one half is in the one half is in the fake tooth, the bridge, whatever it's called. And I can't tell. And I'm like, to me, it looks rotten. I mean, personally, I didn't think I needed to be a dentist to see this, but whatever. I believe, you know, she didn't want to throw her coworker under the bus, whatever. So um, I got to go back. So that was my day wasted there. I got to go back again to get another consultation, another day wasted. And then they're going to have to probably dig it out or whatever. So joy. And then they're giving me options of what I could do. I could do a bridge. I could do a this. And they're giving me the money, how much it's going to cost me. And I'm just like looking at them like, you do know we're in a recession, right? And I'm just, just wondering. And to me, this is all their fault. So my whole thing is, why am I even paying anything? But that's something I'm going to have to deal with. But that, But anyways, that's my little story time on what happened that threw me off for my research and my writing and my this and my that. And that's why the episodes didn't come out. So, you know, I completely flaked on the pod and I apologize to all of you for that because, you know, you expect a certain level of professionalism from me and, you know, you don't bring personal issues to work. So I do apologize for that. But I did think that y'all deserve to know why the episode came out late. And so I 
told you a bit about my business. And for those of y'all who are still here through that boring story, well, thank you. (laughs) And I want to go ahead and give my shout outs and then read your comments from last week's episodes. So first of all, as you all already know, big shout out to my Lamb Patreon group. Thank you so much for supporting Love and Murder with your hard-earned money. I really, really appreciate it. I mean it. I'm serious. I really appreciate it. And I mean, literally, in all honesty, all of my lambs. This is my job. This is the only job I do. It's a full-time job, too. So don't think I'm over here slacking, especially now with the new Kai Rant segment that everyone likes so much. I'm basically going into overtime with this work, but I'm not complaining. Love it. Love it. Wouldn't change it for the world. So your monetary support really helps me in more ways than you can imagine. And I really, really thank you for that. So my Lamb Patreon shout outs, first of all, all of you, but especially the ones who engage like Stacy Marie, Cindy G, and I'm going to say it wrong and I apologize, Sean Yelly, Sean Yelly, Sean Yell, H. Thank you so much for your engagements. It makes me continuously think that somebody's listening. (laughs) Those are my Lamb Patreon engagements. Now, outside of uh, Patreon, in the Lamb Facebook group, Julia Y, I I think it's two names in one, Julia Y, Rachel H. She doesn't speak much, but she engages with everything, literally everything I put out. She likes it, you know, she'll heart it, whatever. So even that small gesture means a lot to me, Julia. Seriously, thank you. Honorable mention is Kathleen MG. And now for your comments from the episodes last week. So last week, there wasn't a lot of comments. So what I decided to do was go like the past two weeks. So so let's go back to episode 115, the case of Lauren Joe Aquin. The poll question that I had out is, did you think that he did it? And 66% of y'all said, no, there was not enough evidence. And the rest said, yes, evidence proved it. This one I'm on defense about. To me, there was not enough evidence. But then again, there was enough circumstantial evidence, which really doesn't mean anything. So I'm on the fence about that one. Then the Kai rants about the mom suing Snapchat because the child died of fentanyl poisoning. My poll on there was, do you agree with her suing uh, suing Snapchat? And it was 50-50. Literally half, half, half of y'all said yes. And I said, tell me why, but you didn't. And then the other half of you said no. Then another comment, well, two more comments on the Kai Rance episode of the Colorado stepmother killing her 11 year old stepson. Vicky C said, no excuse, but his dad kept dumping his son on the stepmom. She married him and he married someone to watch his kid, which was what I was saying in the episode, which is, Why did she have the kid in the first place? Why wasn't he with his mother? Like, that's that's what I couldn't, I couldn't get that either, Vicky. And then Living Masterpiece said, the dad should have paid closer attention to the interactions between Leticia and Gannon. Not to mention, if she didn't want to be responsible for the children, marry somebody without children. Boom, that's what I'm talking about, Living Masterpiece. I completely agree. Why did you marry somebody who had a child if you didn't want to be around children? And yes, the dad should have play, paid closer attention. So I agree with you. And then about the Kai Rance, about Angela Tran, the college student who was stabbed 107 times by her stepdad. Vicky C said that she thought it was sexual. And I think we did say something about that in the episode like maybe he had touched her way back in the day or something. I can't really remember, but that was actually her stepdad and he was crazy. And now as the episode 116, the case of Dawson McGee, I asked, what did you think about this episode? As I do for all episodes and username Vores said, I love Kai's voice and dry humor. Good narrator. And this is Christelle from Belgium. Thank you way from Belgium. That's so awesome. Thank you for listening. And <laughs> I know why you said you like my voice. That's so funny because I said, if you if people say something stupid, I'm not saying your, your uh, comment on air. Because I get comments where uh, I can't stand how you put on uh, 
different voices. It's not funny. Okay, then don't listen to me. Or I literally get comments saying, I don't like your voice. I don't like your comment. I guess we're in agreement. I don't. (laughs) Okay. But thank you, Christelle. Love you all the way from Belgium. And then an episode of Kai Rants, which a Florida mother allegedly planned murder with her son. I put out a poll asking, do you think the mother should be charged? And again, that was split 50-50. Some people said absolutely, and some people said absolutely not. It would be nice if you left me a comment telling me why you thought so or why you didn't think so. But either way, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it'll be nice. Just you answering the poll is enough for me too. And then, so remember, I did a Kyrance where the father found the body of his daughter dead under the bed. And then I had to come out quick and do an update to that because as I was looking for pictures, I found an update. So someone said, Alexa D said, crazy situation with many questions unanswered. I agree. My main question is, how did he get in the house? That's my main question because it, there wasn't any break-ins or, you know, well, any signs of a break-in or anything like that. They said his key was on the floor. Did he drop the key? Did somehow, was this like a key that was so filed down that it worked in a similar lock? Or she had said that she basically, quote, knew this guy because she said, oh, it's the, what did she say? It's the long-haired guy from down the hall. So she was familiar with him. So maybe he was like, hey, it's me, you know, whatever. What was his name again? Jose? I can't remember his name. Sorry, I do so many cases, I can't remember everybody's names. But I think his name was Juan Juan Carlos. That was his name. So maybe he said, hey, it's me, Maria, Juan Carlos, open the door. And maybe she's like, oh, it's the neighbor. Let me open the door. But, you know, we won't know. I guess maybe we'll find out if it goes to trial or something. Maybe he'll... But then maybe not because he said he was so wasted. Everybody said he was so wasted that day. So maybe he doesn't even remember. But that was my main question. And then finally, the last uh, comment I have was Kai Rance, where it was um, it was originally supposed to be a midweek mini. And I just put it out where the influencer um, and her mom did a double homicide. So to that, Aston T said, Hi, I'm a welder. An angle grinder is mostly used in metal working. Different wheels can be used for different reasons. A cutting wheel can be put on to cut metal, which can easily cut through flesh. Wow. Well, thank you, Aston, for letting us know. And this was in response to the case where the father killed his son. And remember, the grandfather was going into the into the house and he was like, I wouldn't go there if I were... Like, he didn't even care. You remember? He didn't even care. I wouldn't go there if I were you. Oh my God. Some people just need to be hit in the face with a chair. Don't judge me. And actually, now that I'm going through the comments, I want to do another honorable mention because I'm seeing that Vicky C seems to comment a lot. So thank you for the interaction. I'm giving you your own special shout out. Vicky C, thank you for your engagement. And that's all I have for your comments. I've figured that I would start trying to do an episode with your comments because Spotify gives me a way to ask your thoughts. And between Spotify and uh, Patreon, Patreon, I can comment. I can engage. I can have fun. Talk to y'all. The Lamb group, I can have conversations in there. The Lamb Facebook group. But then on Spotify, where I get my next most engagement, There's no way for me to answer y'all. So I figured I would do an episode actually responding to y'all. This is the way I'll get my response out. Um, So if you like this, then keep leaving comments and I'll keep making an episode just with your comments. It won't be behind another episode. It'll be literally an episode by itself with your comments. And finally, I want to thank you all for listening to my podcast and supporting my work. I am constantly striving to bring you the best true crime content possible, but it does take me a lot of time, effort, and resources to do so. 
If you enjoy my podcast and want to support my work, I invite you to join my Patreon. There, you'll get access to exclusive content, behind-the-scenes access, and even merchandise. With the merchandise, everybody gets access to the merchandise, but my Patreons get special discount codes. Like I said before, this is my full-time job, and this is where my income comes from. This entire process with my teeth is going to cost me about $3,500, and I don't ask for handouts. I work for my money. So even though I ask y'all every week to join Patreon, you know, it's not a handout I'm asking for. You do get extra content for your donations to me. $3 a month will get you commercial free episodes and all the extra content that's in every case, like the pictures in this case. $5 a month will get you all of that and one bonus episode every month. $10 a month gives you more bonuses. And at $25 a month, you get everything including a producer title. No matter if it's just five cents that you decide to give, every little bit helps me be able to produce more and better content for you. And I am truly grateful for your support. I am so grateful that you support my little podcast. People told me, why am I doing this? You don't have the voice for radio. You know, so much stuff has happened since I started Love and Murder, had a co-host, co-host left, had another co-host, that co-host left. And every time I thought of quitting, like literally, I'm not even joking with you. Every time I thought of quitting, I got messages from the first time I thought of quitting, I got a message from one of the victim's families. And they told me that this podcast helped them. Second time I thought of quitting, I got a message from a friend of the family. Third time I thought of quitting, uh, something happened with y'all. Y'all did something, said something. I can't even remember what it was. But it was like every time I thought of quitting, I got incentive to continue. And I'm really happy I continued. And I really like that, you know, y'all like what I'm doing. I'm really, I really like that I put smiles on people's faces, even though it's true crime and you're smiling at true crime. That it's kind of creepy, <laughs> but I'm happy. <laughs> and I'm very, very grateful for your support, like I said. Now, I'm not going to cry, so I'm going to end this with saying thank you. And you can also check out the new Lamb Shop on Etsy or Etsy, which I add new items every week. And you can go to lambmarket.etsy.com, Etsy, <laughs> L-A-M-M-A-R-K-E-T dot E-T-S-Y dot com. The shop you'd be looking for is literally called Lamb Market, L-A-M-M-A-R-K-E-T. There are hoodies, mugs, 2024 calendars that I designed by myself, and so much more. Right now, Etsy has a sale going on for $10 off of $40 or more, so it's a great time to come and check my shop out. My store is among one of them participating in this st- sale. Apparently not all Etsy shops are doing it. So you can just put your stuff in your cart, put my stuff in your cart that I designed and use code YES10, Y-E-S, and then the number 10 at checkout. The sale started today and it's going to end on Wednesday, October 11th at 11.59 p.m. Both Patreon and the Lamb Store link are in the show notes below. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed the show, your story time, and the shout outs. I'll see you in the next episode. And remember that it's all love and no murder, y'all. Bye. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In Network. If you would like to nominate a true crime podcast to be featured, just send me a tweet at Indie Drop-In. I'd also love to hear if one of our featured podcasts is now your favorite show. Indie Drop-In survives off ad revenue and listener donations. If you would like to contribute, please consider buying me a coffee. You can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Indie Drop-In. If you look at the very bottom of the episode description, I put a link in there to make it really easy. Indie Drop-In has many other shows that you also might like. Just go to IndieDropIn.com. All right, see you next week.